This is the power efficiency tester I've built for evaluating my flashlight driver's performance. In the previous episodes, we covered the design of the LED boost driver in detail, and I mentioned how boost drivers should theoretically be superior in efficiency compared to linear drivers. In this video, we'll design and build an efficiency tester, calibrate it, and use it to compare the efficiency of my boost driver with an off-the-shelf linear driver. LED flashlight drivers are essentially power converters. They take input power, like from a lithium cell, and output the power to the LED, usually after doing something to the voltage. The power efficiency is then the ratio of the output power to the input power. So if the output power is exactly the same as the input power, the converter is perfectly efficient. To calculate the input and output power, we need to know the voltages and currents. Measuring the efficiency can be a pretty time-consuming process, since you need to measure two voltages and two currents for each data point. Repeating for a few different input and output settings to get a spreadsheet like this one made by the Freeman on BLF. But why spend one hour doing it manually when you can spend one month almost automating it? Let's design an almost all-in-one efficiency tester. First, we need to be able to measure our input and output currents. To do that, we'll use two current sense resistors. We'll measure the voltage across these resistors with differential ADCs. We need to know the input voltage to calculate input power, so we do that with another ADC. To calculate the actual output power, we need the voltage across the load, so we use two more ADCs for that. To tie everything together and to transfer the data to the computer, we use a microcontroller. I chose the RP2040, which is a microcontroller in the Raspberry Pi Pico. I've been using it in a few other projects recently, like in my dynamometer, and I quite enjoy using it, so this was a good opportunity to make a custom board with it. With this design, instead of measuring only a few data points manually, we can record tens or hundreds of data points every second if we wanted to. I designed the schematics and PCB in KiCad, and PCBWay had the boards made and sent to me at no charge. I placed the components by hand and reflowed the board using a combination of a hot plate and a hot air gun. This is what it looks like fully assembled. Writing the firmware was simple enough, and we were ready to start the calibration process before long. Because the board has things like current sense resistors and connectors that contribute to losses, we need to account for them if we are planning on getting reasonably accurate efficiency measurements. This is especially important since we are operating at fairly high currents, so even small resistances would noticeably affect our efficiency calculations. In particular, we are looking at the resistances along this high current path. We will model them as four resistors, one on each connector. We will call them R1 to R4. With a known calibration voltage and calibration resistance, we can use a bit of an unusual wiring setup to calculate the values of these four resistances. We are essentially replacing the power converter with a wire and using the calibration resistance as a load. This should get us as close as possible to perfect efficiency. We'll pass the calibration current through the same path, and we'll hook up our ADCs to measure the voltages at a few critical nodes in our circuit. One thing to note is that the ADCs on board need a zero volt reference, also known as ground, and I've chosen this node which is normally connected to the negative terminal of the power input. The presence of R4, however, means ground might not be at the same potential as the negative terminal of the calibration voltage source. Nevertheless, with this setup, we have all the information we need to calculate the values of R1 to R4, at least in theory. The reason I'm explaining all this using a block diagram is because when it's wired up in real life, it ends up looking like this. Using my programmable power supply as the calibration voltage source, I set it up to output a triangle wave, slowly sweeping from 0 volts to 5 volts and back. I've chosen to use a 1 ohm aluminum housed power resistor rated for 100 watts and that's a banana for scale. We don't actually need that high of a power rating, but I thought it might help with dissipating the heat. However, even with a cooling fan, the resistor ended up getting pretty hot. If we assume the uncalibrated board has zero losses, we can estimate the calibration resistance using the measurements from the efficiency tester. Unsurprisingly, we can quite clearly see the resistance climbing as the resistor heats up. One solution would be to improve the cooling system, but I decided it would be easier to reduce the power on time to half a second, followed by a one second cooldown period. Of course, I had to increase the voltage step size so the test could be completed within a reasonable amount of time. These changes reduced the rise in calibration resistance, allowing us to complete the calibration process. 
The calculations give us a whole bunch of resistance values for each of R1 to R4, but I wanted to simplify things to just a single resistance value by assuming all four resistances are equal. So I took the median of all these values, which resulted in a value of about 20 milliohms. With this value, we can compare the estimate of the calibration resistance, which we know to be 1 ohm, before and after calibration. And it looks close enough for me. Finally, we can get on with some testing. We start with the boost driver of my own design. It's meant to operate on a single lithium cell and output to a Cree XHP 50.3HI LED with a typical forward voltage of 6 volts. Setting the bench power supply to 4.2 volts, which corresponds to a fully charged lithium cell, I recorded a dataset while the flashlight driver ramped the LED brightness up and down continuously. The efficiency readings look pretty reasonable between 0 amps and 4 amps, but we end up hitting the 5 amp current limit of my bench power supply. To have a better idea of what's really happening, we need to also look at the measured input voltage alongside output current and efficiency. One way to visualize this is to use a 3D scatter plot, but it really requires some form of interactivity to work well. Instead, we'll use a color bar for efficiency and plot the input voltage and output current on the horizontal and vertical axes, respectively. We can see that as we try to output a higher current, the input voltage falls drastically, and that corresponds with a huge drop in efficiency. What this means is that I need a more powerful bench power supply. So I went shopping. What this means is I need to make do with what I have. Like one of these 18650 cells I rescued from the electronics dump. Using an 18650 cell better reflects real life usage of a flashlight anyway. I could also use one of these new 21700 cells, but you'll see why I didn't in a minute. Looking up the datasheet for the 18650 cell, it's actually rated for a pretty high current. There will of course still be a voltage drop because of the internal resistance, but beggars can't be choosers. The cell needs some wires to be able to connect to the test setup, and these cheap cell holders aren't going to cut it with the currents we're operating at. But I don't have a spot welder, so I'm going to have to commit some atrocities. If you're enjoying this video so far, please consider subscribing. If you didn't know, soldering to lithium cells is discouraged because you might end up overheating it. But I was careful to monitor the temperatures during the process, which lowers the risk some. That's why I decided to spare my shiny new 21700s. Here's what the setup looks like after I've replaced the bench power supply with the 18650 abomination. Of course, the cell isn't programmable like the bench power supply, but the 18650 does still kinda have a voltage sweep function. It just takes a lot longer than before. Here's what the test data looks like. Because I programmed the boost driver to automatically turn the LED off when the cell voltage falls below 3 volts, we don't really see anything much below that. Another thing to note is that the ADCs on the efficiency tester aren't really synchronized. They're just running at high sampling rates, so the sampling times will be close enough, usually. However, if the conditions are changing fast enough, like when the LED shuts off abruptly at the 3 volt threshold, we could end up with some funky readings, like these here. Instead of properly fixing this problem with synchronized ADCs, I'm just going to fix it in post with some outlier rejection, which I've implemented with binning. Imagine a simpler situation where I'm measuring just one thing, say the brightness of the room. As I'm taking the many repeated measurements, lightning flashes outside, and I get a spike in my dataset. It's easy for us to visually identify the outliers, especially since this is a one-dimensional dataset. But imagine if we had measurements in more than three dimensions, like in our efficiency tester. A more general, multi-dimensional way to identify outliers is to use a histogram. This is what it looks like with our 1D dataset. After binning the data points, we can set a threshold that allows us to identify data points that appear far less frequently than we are expecting and mark them as anomalies. We can then remove these data points, leaving us with the clean data. We use the same process for the dataset from the efficiency tester, but in five dimensions. With the outliers removed, we're left with this. Like before, we'll use a color bar for efficiency and plot the input voltage and output current on the horizontal and vertical axes. It's immediately apparent that there's a chunk of the plot missing in the top right corner. That is the high input voltage and high output current region, 
which simply doesn't exist due to the voltage drop caused by the internal resistance of the 18650 cell. There's also a sharp drop-off in efficiency towards the high current output region. Perhaps that's where the boost driver IC switches modes, but I'm not sure. You have entered the name, not sure. At extremely low currents, the efficiency also falls, quite likely due to the higher current sense resistance used for low brightness modes. We call this feature HDR, and you can find more information about it in the previous videos on boost driver design. The boost driver also needs a small amount of power for the electronics even if the LED is off. So that will have a larger impact on the low output current efficiency as well. Overall, the efficiency ranges between about 84% and 97%, with the peak efficiencies occurring around 1 amp output current. We can't just stop here without some kind of a comparison, so I took apart my Convoy S2 Plus to get to the driver for testing. I soldered some extra wires to it so it could be connected to the test setup. It's a linear driver, which essentially acts as a variable resistor to regulate the output, burning off the excess power. Because this driver doesn't have a brightness sweep mode, it wouldn't make sense to use the 18650 as the power source. Leaving it on a high, fixed brightness would probably cause a meltdown. Instead, I set the bench power supply to sweep between 3 volts and 4.2 volts, which lets me get a few more data points. By turning the power supply off and back on quickly, I can also simulate the user toggling the power switch to navigate between the four brightness modes. Having only four discrete brightnesses compared to a full brightness sweep leaves us with a pretty sparse looking dataset. Each of these four discrete brightnesses forms a distinct line on our plot. The top right region is again missing due to the voltage drop. But what's interesting is that the top left region is missing as well. My guess is that at the maximum brightness setting, we're almost applying the full input voltage directly to the LED, allowing the forward voltage of the LED and the internal resistances to limit the current. Therefore, the higher the input voltage, the higher the output current. Allowing the maximum possible current to pass through also means a smaller proportion of the power is wasted by current regulation, which results in higher efficiency. At the lower brightness modes, smaller input voltages also mean less power has to be wasted by the regulator, again resulting in higher efficiency. Overall, the efficiency ranges between about 55% and 95%, with the peak efficiency happening at the lowest input voltage and the highest output current. This has been a fun little project. The boost driver seems to be more efficient overall, especially at medium brightnesses. But if you're exclusively operating at maximum brightness, then the linear driver's the better choice. Let me know what you think. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and if you have, please subscribe.